Let's get into the Word of God uh, together. Uh, we're starting a new series, our Christmas series, called Glory to the Newborn King. Glory to the Newborn King. And uh, we're looking at various characters in the Nativity story. Uh, we're gonna see how they brought glory to this newborn king. Look at the principles from there. Think about our own lives, about how we can, day by day, bring glory uh, to the newborn king. And today we're looking at the shepherds. So we're gonna read the shepherd's story together, uh, just a few verses in Luke chapter 2 from verse 8. You can turn in your Bible, click on your phone, or it'll be on the screen. So let's read this together, uh, Luke chapter 2 from verse 8. That's where I'm hoping it comes on the screen to help me. Okay, I'm going to open my Bible and uh, we'll read this. Okay, great. Luke chapter 2 from verse 8. Is it there? Great. And there were trouble. Oh, great. I don't have to look at the back of my head. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told." You know, in 2006, May 2006, a man by the name of Guy Gomer turned up to the BBC News studios for a job interview. He originated from the Republic of Congo and was a business studies graduate, and he'd applied for a job in the IT department of the BBC. In another reception, a kind of side reception of the, the building in London, uh, sat a, guy, a, a, a man by the name of Guy Cooney. And Guy Cooney was scheduled to appear on BBC News 24 Live to be interviewed about Apple's court case against the, the record label that had the rights to the songs of the Beatles. This was back in 2006. Streaming music had just began and it was an issue about how royalties worked, etc. So if you get the picture, Guy Goma is sat in one reception, in the main reception, waiting for his job interview. Guy Cooney is sat in another reception, waiting to be called to appear on TV. So the producer of BBC News 24 is tasked with going to collect Guy Cooney from the reception. He goes down to the main reception of BBC, asks the receptionist, where is Guy sitting? She points to Guy Goma, and he goes over to Guy Goma and says, are you Guy? Guy Goma thinks this is my moment for my job interview. He nods his head and follows the producer and is taken into the studios of BBC News 24. He gets makeup put on his face. He gets strapped up with a microphone. He thinks it's just part of the job interview at BBC News, thinks I was applying for the IT department, but maybe this is just part of the process, too polite to ask any questions. And before he knows it, he sees the fingers go up, three, two, one, the lights come on, and the interviewer turns to him and starts asking asking him questions about Apple's court case against the, uh, the royalty holder of the Beatles songs. It was a spectacular moment. And many of you uh, may remember that. Some of you weren't even born when this happened. Some of you were little children, and so you didn't know that it happened. And so I tr thought I'd treat us this morning, and let's watch this incredible moment with Guy Goma on BBC News. For the 
industry and the growth of music online. Well, Guy Cuny is the editor of the technology website uh, News Wireless. Hello, good morning to you. Good morning. Were you surprised by this uh, verdict today? I'm very surprised to see this verdict to, to come on me because I was not expecting that. When I came, uh, they told me something else and I'm coming. You, you got an interview there, so it's a big surprise anyway. A big surprise. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, with regards to uh, the cost that's in, in, involved, um, do you think uh, now more people will be downloading online? Uh, actually, if you can go everywhere, you're going you're gonna to see a lot of people downloading uh, to the internet uh, and the website, uh, everything they want. But I think uh, it's, it's much better for the development and uh, to improve people what uh, they want and to get uh, on the easy way and so fast uh, the things they're looking for. This does really seem to be the way the music industry is progressing now, that people want to go onto the website and download music. Exactly. You can go everywhere on the cyber cafe and you can check. You can go easy. It's going to be a very easy way for everyone to get something to the internet. Thank you, Thanks very much indeed. I think we can now also speak to... Uh Don't you love that he actually predicts what we're all doing now day by day? Just off the cuff predicts about uh, streaming music. And tragic at the end there, isn't it? When I was reading this story, he actually went then from that traumatic experience into his job interview and he didn't even get the job that he arrived for. Uh, but if you picture that face when she says Guy Cooney and he realizes oh, I'm the wrong man in the wrong place, I think that expression was the expression that the shepherds had when they arrived in that place with Mary and Joseph and they looked at that baby's face at the Messiah's face see the shepherds realized they were something way beyond themselves and you will know that if if we wrote the Christmas story if we were tasked to think about how the Messiah would arrive on earth you or I wouldn't pick the characters that are picked to be in this story we wouldn't order it the way that it's ordered. And yet somehow in God's sovereignty, he decided to include these very unlikely people in the arrival of the Messiah. We're familiar with this story. We know it because we've heard it year after year, all of our lives. And yet if we were given a blank sheet without what we know, we would not write the story in this way. And, and I think most surprisingly, out of all of the characters that make up the story of the Nativity, the shepherds are the most surprising. They heard this incredible announcement and they were the first to receive news about the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And yet they should not have been the first people to receive this incredible news. In the Old Testament, shepherds have a good reputation. You'll know this as you read the Old Testament. Psalm 23 may be the most famous scripture of all time, which speaks about the Lord being our shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses spent a portion of his life being a shepherd. They were, they were well-respected. Um, it was a well-respected career. In fact, all the way through the Bible is threaded this idea that people that God is our shepherd and that the people that lead God's people are shepherds. And yet these shepherds that arrive in the nativity story in the first century were not people that had a good reputation. In fact, it was recommended that if you were gonna do business, if you were a respectable person, you shouldn't do business with a shepherd. A, a, a historian or a, a contemporary writer of the first century described them as dishonest and thieving. They led their flocks on other people's lands and they pilfered the produce. This is what somebody of the day wrote about shepherds. Anything that you bought from a shepherd was pre presumed to be stolen. And they weren't trusted even to be witnesses in courts. So if there was a, a, a court case, you could not call a shepherd to be a witness for your case. They couldn't observe ceremonial laws uh, like washing and attending temple, which were so vitally important for a first century Jew at the time. And so they were officially labeled, officially labeled sinners by the religious leaders of the time. This meant they were, they were ostracized, they were outcasts in society. These people should not have been the first guests to be present at the newborn, uh, of any newborn baby, let alone this newborn baby. 
And yet the shepherds find themselves, just like Guy Gomer found himself in this incredibly privileged position, the shepherds find themselves in the presence of the king. Let me just say for a minute before we really get going here uh, that you may feel the most unqualified, unworthy, unlikely person, but you have an invitation into the presence of God. In fact, the more unworthy and unlikely you feel, the more the invitation is extended to you. This is what the shepherds tell us, that maybe you feel like Guy Gomer, you feel as comfortable and as uh, in place as Guy Gomer did in that News 24 studio. Maybe you feel as out of place as he did in this space today, in this church today. Can I tell you that you have an invitation from heaven to be here? And if you feel out of place and you feel like you're inexperienced, you're not sure what to do and you feel uncomfortable, hey, you're just in the right place. And today's title, as we think about the shepherds in this series, is Seeking His Presence. Seeking His Presence. The Christmas story arguably is all about presence. The announcement of Jesus' arrival was that he would be Emmanuel, God with us, God present with us. When John wrote his gospel in chapter one and verse 14, he said this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He became present. The message paraphrase puts it that Jesus moved into the neighborhood, that he came to be present with us. And there are three things that I think we learn from the shepherd's story about seeking his presence. And we're gonna learn some principles from them today. Uh, Think about our own lives, what the shepherds um, teach us. The first one is this, the invitation. The invitation. It is 12 years ago today that Leanne and I got engaged. I got down in one knee uh, and proposed to Leanne. I know, a great day. And uh, we decided, or she decided, um, that we would hand make our wedding invitations. We had a short engagement. We got married the following summer, so about six months or so of being engaged. And at that time, um, one of the million hobbies that Leanne's had at the time that I've known her, one of them was card making, and she used to hand make cards. And there was this shop, a particular shop that sold card making stuff. And I remember going in there one day and there was these white embossed uh, cards uh, and they had all these patterns on them. And uh, she decided they were gonna be our wedding invitations. And not only were we gonna hand make them, but we were gonna hand color them with metallic pens. We took the embossed flowers and swirly things and colored them in by hand with these metallic pens. How many of you know that by the 300th invitation, uh, it started to grow a bit thin, right? We, the first few we were thinking about who this is gonna be for and how we were gonna put something unique on it. By the, by, but as we went along, it started to become a mass produced thing. I remember sitting and laying them out and sticking the same thing along as we, as we came. About the first dozen people had a bespoke invitation. The rest, we were done with it. We were trying to get through them as quickly as we could so that we could send them out. It was a bad decision. So if you're planning to get married one day, do not hand make your invitations. It's 2021, send them to a printer and get them mass done. But an invitation came to these shepherds. The angels came and presented an invitation to them. And though, as I've said, they were completely out of place, the invitation that came to them was not an accident. God was making a statement to us. He was showing us something. And I don't know, maybe you think the shepherds were there just because Jesus was born in a stable and there were probably sheep and probably some shepherds. No, this was a bespoke invitation that went to these group of shepherds. They were not there by accident. They were invited, they were VIPs, special guests to this moment. And you'll know royal births should have dignitaries. The coming of the Messiah should have had some kind of religious leader and gone through the religious system, but not so with Jesus. Jesus' arrival is turning everything on its head, that the lowest of the low are the first to hear the news of the coming Messiah, of the baby that has been born. And isn't it wonderful that those who were officially labeled as sinners were guests of honor in his presence. And this is the message of Jesus. Jesus has a lifetime of inviting sinners into his presence. You remember when Matthew, 
or Levi as he was known. He's a taxer, a tax collector, hated and despised by the people of his day. And Jesus calls him to be in his 12, in his disciples. And, and Matthew, Matthew throws a party in Luke chapter five. We read the story about it. It says Levi threw a great banquet for Jesus and invited his friends who happened to all be tax collectors. And the religious people come and they challenge and they say to the disciples, why is Jesus eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? I like to think that there might have been some shepherds there. And Jesus answered them and he said this, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Who was the invitation for? These shepherds who were officially labeled as sinners. And the shepherds, I want you to see this, the shepherds didn't have to wash up, clean up, become better to receive this invitation. In fact, they weren't asked to be more religious. The the angels didn't say, if you could go and do the ceremonial washing, if you could attend and make your sacrifices in the temple, then you can come into the presence of the King of Kings. No, no, no. The invitation was to encounter this person, not to go to the temple, but to encounter the baby Jesus, to encounter Jesus, to come and Jesus came to earth, primarily Jesus came to earth so that you could know him so that you could have a relationship with him. The invitation wasn't to go to a religious service. The invitation wasn't to go to church more. The invitation was to encounter a person. And Jesus isn't just a historical person. He's not just a theological concept to understand or a religious leader. Jesus is a man, a person. And this is the message of Christmas, that Jesus became a man. And the primary way that God wants you to understand him is relationally. God wants to have a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And whatever else we have made being a Christian, We need to lay that aside because the shepherds didn't need anything religious to be in the presence of the newborn king. And this is the incredible message of the Christian faith. Any other faith, you have to do something, act a certain way, wear a certain thing to be accepted into the presence of that God. But our God, Jesus, says, come as you are with all of your mess ups and your hang ups, smelling like sheep, not ceremonially clean, not having been in favor with the religious people, simply come as you are. Listen, we don't get clean to come to him. The invitation is to come and he helps us to get clean. And there are, there are many things, many things, and maybe I shouldn't admit this as I stand in this privileged place, but you know, there's many things that I don't know about theology. I get nervous when people come and say, I've got a question about the Bible because I don't know so many of the questions. There are people I know in the life of this church that know far more than me about the Bible and about theology. But I wanna tell you, I don't know everything, but I know him. I know him. And there's many, many, there's many unanswered questions that I have. I've got a whole list when I get to eternity that I'm gonna ask God, how does this work and why did that happen and, and what does this mean in the Bible and how does the scripture, but all the, the one thing that I do know is Jesus Christ. I know him and I'm rubbish at apologetics. I'm rubbish when people want to ask me and challenge my faith because I don't know how to answer with all of the right answers in all of the right ways. And I praise God that there's people in this church and out there that love uh, debating and giving an argument for the Christian faith. But when people ask me, all I say is I know that Jesus is real. There's an incredible story in John chapter nine where there's a man who's blind, healed on the Sabbath, and it causes an uproar because Jesus has healed somebody on the Sabbath. And the religious leaders and teachers are trying to figure it out, and they're trying to say, uh, was it because he was a sinner? Was it because his parents was a sinner? Does healing work on the Sabbath? Is Jesus, can he heal? Did he do the healing or did Yahweh do the healing? How does it all work? And I love the response of the blind man in chapter, uh, chapter nine, verse 25 of John's gospel. He says this, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. 
And I don't know everything, but I tell you, I was once blind, but now I see. And there was an invitation that was given to me. And let me tell you, I'm so thankful for the day in 2000, January of 2000, that my neighbors knocked my door and said, Tom, tomorrow we're going to church. Do you want to come with us? We started a new church. And would you like to come and see what it's like and experience it? And as a nine-year-old, I went along to church and I've been to church pretty, pretty much every single Sunday after that. But I didn't just encounter church. Church. I didn't just encounter as you've encountered a welcome and nice people and some worship music, but I encountered Jesus. And I'm thankful that somebody gave me that invitation. I wanna honour you today as a church. You know, Leanne and I, through a couple of different stories this week, have heard from people and they've said this on separate occasions, your church is incredible at inviting people. Isn't that wonderful? And I wanna, wanna say a well done to you for being the type of people that invite people. In fact, for Leanne, she was at this appointment and the person rolled their eyes and said, yeah, I'm always getting people inviting me to that church. Maybe I should come one time. And she said, yeah, you should come and try it out. But let's be the people that don't give up giving the invitation to others, to keep knocking the doors and, and giving that invitation. Even the people that we think are the most unlikely, unworthy, are the people that don't fit at all. They're just the kind of people that God wants in this place today. We're a whole bunch of misfits. None of us belong here. None of us are good enough to be here. But there was an invitation that was given to us. See, there was the invitation, but there was the response. The response. After seeing this amazing sight of a great company of the heavenly host praising God, they chatted together. And in verse 16, it says, they hurried off. And, and it's a bit polite, but what really the, the original language, the Greek is trying to get, they ran to that, that place. They went searching. And, and don't you love that thought? They, they went to Bethlehem and it wasn't a big town, but they, they had to look through Bethlehem. They were looking for, for a stable, for a place where there was a baby. Maybe they heard Jesus' voice crying crying from that, uh, from that manger. Uh, I don't know how it worked, but they finally, uh, you know, you imagine they're running, they're running, and then they see this incredible sight, this baby lying in a manger, this couple looking over this child. But by its very nature, an invitation to become anything more than just an invitation needs a response. Seeking to be in the presence of, of the king meant that these shepherds had to move from where they were. They had to change their location. And there were, there were many logical reasons why the shepherds should, should have stayed in the field. They, they were neglecting their role. They should have stayed with their sheep. What about the, the wolves? What about the other dishonest shepherds that might have come and stolen their flocks? What about the fire that was burning? What about the, the land that they were on? Maybe other shepherds would have moved in and taken over that land. And yet something about this invitation brought up a response that meant these shepherds didn't even think about it, didn't even debate about whether they should go. They they left that place and they went and found Jesus. And I wonder today, maybe you're stuck in a field. And maybe there's some good reasons why you're in that field. There's some responsibilities that you have, but God is inviting you to leave the place where you're at, metaphorically leave that place and pursue his presence. I wonder if your career or your friends and family or other people's expectations of you or your, your self-doubts and concerns and inadequacies are causing you to stay in a place that God is not intending you to stay. He's calling you to seek his presence, to seek him out, and yet you're remaining in a field and God today is reminding you of the invitation to come to come, to leave behind it. And I felt particularly strongly as I, as I was preparing that there's people that all you think about is, I can't become a Christian because what about those people? What would they say? I can't go, go further into the life of the church or join a team or commit myself more regularly because what would they think if I did that? What would they say? And you're consumed with, with other people's thoughts about yourself. And God is saying, no, 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 listen to the invitation. Hear the, the gravity, the, the, the power of this invitation and come. Don't worry about anything that leaves you in the field. Respond to the invitation and find God. And they, they go and they say, let's go and see this thing that has happened. And when we seek him, God isn't hiding God is desperate to be found by you. And maybe you've got in your head that it's like God is, is hiding. God isn't, God is waiting for you to seek him. We love as a family to play hide and seek. 
And we don't live in a particularly kind of uh, old house that's got nooks and crannies or anything. It's a fairly basic house. There's not many, too, too many hiding places. But, you know, I'm ready to hide for a week when we play hide and seek. I'm, I'm figuring out the best place. And I'm going to knuckle down in there. And uh, I'm waiting for the day when we're going to play hide and seek in this building. But that's, that's another story. I'm going to be gone for a month. I've got places in this building. I'm ready. But we play it as a family. And you'll know this if you have young kids or have played hide and seek. My kids hide, but they're desperate to be found they, they stick their feet out or they hide and when I go in a room you know it you, know, you can picture the scene I say I'm coming and I hear their, their giggles behind the curtain or uh, you know even you know this morning uh, the, the girls were playing hide and seek in the team's room and, and uh, they were playing it with uh, Chris Hoodie's building manager today and they were, they were playing it and my daughter decided to hide right in front of Chris Hood under a table that's right there they're desperate to be found and, and I put the the proviso out there that I'm, I'm not great at theology. So forgive me in this next statement, but it's almost like God is like my kids with hide and seek. Because God isn't hiding away from you, waiting for you to find him. God is desperately waiting to be found by you. And as soon as you take a step towards him, oh, God comes running towards you. You know that picture of the prodigal son, that he saw his son on the horizon and he picked up his cloak, he lost all dignity and he ran towards his son. And that's what God does for us when we take just one step towards him. He's waiting for you to seek him, but God loves it when we respond, when we, when we take a step towards him. And this is our calling. Beyond all of the, the bespoke calling that God has on your life and the dreams and visions that you have, your primary calling is to draw nearer to Jesus every single day. And my purpose, my meaning, my freedom, my forgiveness, my wholeness, happiness, self-worth, identity, past, present, and future are found in one person and his name is Jesus. Why would I not do anything but seek his presence, pursue him every day? Listen, nothing else compares than Jesus. You can build the greatest career, have all of the stuff that you want, make the life of dreams, but without Jesus, it's nothing. He gives us everything and so let's respect Respond and pursue his presence every single day. See, there was an invitation, there was a response, and then thirdly, there was the result. The result, because once they encountered Jesus, it, the Bible says there was wonder and amazement. And they began spreading the words, uh, spreading the word of this news. Isn't it amazing that the shepherds who couldn't qualify to be witnesses in court were witnesses to the greatest event that has happened in all of the cosmos, all of the universe, for all of time. The incarnation, the coming of God, God being made man and coming to earth was the pivotal moment. Uh, one theologian described it as this, was, this is like the hinges on which the door of all time swing. This moment that God came to earth and here are these shepherds and they're witnessing to this incredible news. But the result of this, their, their response was not just to witness, but to praise and to give thanks. And this is really what I felt God wanted to strongly say to us today, because I feel like uh, there's, there's people in the room and I feel like God wanted to speak to you today because you've lost the wonder. You've lost the wonder of Jesus. And Simon even said it as he led us in worship. I've had the privilege of going to Petra in Jordan twice in my life. And uh, apologies, I haven't got a picture of it. Uh, you can Google it, uh, but some of you will know it. It's in Indiana Jones, the building when they, in the desert and they see it. And Petra is a city carved in the rocks, completely in the desert. And if you've ever been there, you'll know you, you walk along, you arrive in Petra and you walk along through the cliffs, these cliffs that are red and different colors. And it's very thin. At some points, only a few people can fit side by side as you weave your way round. And then it turns a corner and you see through the crack the, the, the most spectacular building, the treasury building. There's, there's hundreds of buildings in this city, but this one is the most well-preserved. It's the one that's in Indiana Jones. And I remember the first time I turned that corner and saw that building and, and utterly speechless as you see this carving in the rock. It's incredible. And I remember the second time that we went and I was grumpy that day because I got sand in my eyes 
and I'm a millennial and I don't cope things with, well with things like that. And I remember being there, my eyes were watering and they were sore because of all the sand. I remember grumping about being in this place. I remember walking along that and going, yeah, yeah I think it's a couple more corners and we'll see it. And uh, I was so familiar because I'd seen it before. And I remember turning that corner in the group that we were with. I remember watching their reactions to something that I'd seen before. And I'd lost the wonder of this moment. Seeing people that were seeing it for the first time, I remember standing with Leanne, wow. And there was I like, oh yeah, yeah, there's more to see around the corner. I'd lost the wonder, lost the moment, rubbing my eyes and crying like a millennial. But I wonder today if you've lost the wonder, you've lost the passion for Him. You've been distracted by life. It's like you've got sand in your eyes. And you began reading your Bible and praying and serving, attending, all out of obligation and expectation. And you've lost the wonder of the moment. You've lost the wonder of what it means to be able to know Jesus Christ, to know Him, to give glory to the newborn King. And maybe there's many responsibilities in the field. Maybe there's a lot going on in your life and, and you know, it remains difficult times that we live in and we're all navigating everything that's going on in our world. And maybe you've got caught up with that and you've lost hearing the invitation to come and wonder at Jesus, to come and give glory to Him, to, to re-look in that crib, to look at the face of Jesus. And you know, the band led us so well today. And it was great having the choir and and singing out. And I love raising my hands. I love raising my voice. I I love giving everything for Him in worship. You know why? Because I still haven't quite gotten over that God saved me. I still haven't quite gotten over that for some reason in 2000, my neighbours decided to knock the door and invite me to church. And I shouldn't be even here stood on this platform. I shouldn't even be in this building. But for some reason, God picked me out and gave me an invitation. I haven't quite gotten over that moment. And I haven't quite gotten over the privilege. And, and please, I, I, I'm a relaxed kind of person. Not, not many things wind me up in life. I think too, life's too short to be wound up about a lot of stuff. But you know, it bothers me when we're not ready to lift up our voices and raise our hands and give praise to God. Wouldn't it be amazing if we were the kind of church that raised the roof off of this place every Sunday? And you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not very sporty. And when I've gone to see sports stuff in places where you go see where they kick balls or throw them or do things with them, I'm I'm always amazed at the passion of the people in that place. And and I was thinking about this this week and I thought, you know, there's an internal value there that I have that I don't ever wanna be caught being more passionate somewhere else than in the house of God. This is a place that deserves my shouts. He deserves my shouts. He deserves my voice being raised up. He deserves me getting off my feet and praising Him. Why? Because I was just a sinner. I was labelled as a shepherd, but an invitation came to me to come and encounter the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I wonder today, Let's be the kind of people. Come on, church, we gotta shake off some apathy, shake off some nervousness about COVID and about everything that's going on in our world. And we gotta seek His presence. What it looks like is tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. in our foyer, when at the moment about 20 people are gathering to pray of a church of a thousand people to pray to Jesus and to acknowledge all of this is because of Him. We're not here because of the lights and the cinema and the movie nights, we're here because of Him. It looks like those moments. And we're gonna come in a moment, we're gonna get ready to to lose our dignity a bit as we give some glory and some praise to God. But there's an invitation for some people to leave the field and to come and encounter Jesus. And you're here today and that word was for you. You're worried about what people will think of you. And God is saying, come, you're not gonna worry. You're gonna encounter me. And I tell you, there's this invitation. If you respond, it's the best feeling you'll ever have in your life. It's like coming home and the Christmas tree lights are on and the mince pies are in the oven and everything feels warm and great. That's what it feels like to encounter Jesus, to know that we're in relationship with Him. And you might feel like a sinner. You might feel like the worst person. The shepherds really were the worst people. They were officially called the worst people. And yet the invitation came first for them. So we're gonna bow our heads just for a minute to give you a moment. You know this is for you. 
Maybe you've been coming here for a long time, but you wouldn't say that you know Jesus, that you've been, as it were, coming along, but you haven't looked in that crib, you haven't seen Jesus yet. And this is you responding and saying, I wanna see Jesus, I wanna respond today. And I'm gonna invite you in just a moment to raise your hand where you are. And the t- the, nobody's looking, it's just a team of people that are gonna give you a Bible. Put that in your hand as you raise it. Listen, there's an invitation to you. Your response is gonna be to raise a hand. And the result is that God is gonna see your hand and meet you where you are. So if that's you, just raise your hand right now where you are. Don't worry about what other people are thinking. Don't worry about what other people will say. Just raise your hand right where you are. That's wonderful. Is there anybody else today? You know you need to make a step towards Jesus. Maybe you were once in that place that you were so close to Jesus, but you've stopped seeking Him and you've gone back to the field. You wanna say, Jesus, I'm coming back to you today. Maybe you've had 10 Bibles from us already. Don't do it again. Make another commitment. Say, Jesus, I'm coming to you today. That's wonderful. So good. You know, if anybody, you you can open your eyes again. Somebody, you can open your eyes. You know, at the end, there's gonna be a prayer team here down on your right. And if you want a prayer about anything, then they're gonna be available for you to stand and, uh, and come down and they'll pray with you. They'll hang out after the service and they can help you in any way and pray with you. But we're gonna praise God. I was thinking, in fact, let's stand together. Let's stand. Listen, we're fine for time. We're okay. We're on time. So you don't need to rush and get your kids. If you normally rush and get the kids during this song, just hold back for this moment if you can. That would be fantastic. Teams, let's just hold back from rushing because I believe that we just got something to do here together before we get onto the business of all the things that happen afterwards. You know, I, I saw these decorations and I remembered cast back in my mind. It's about a year ago that we started filming Sunday services from this building. We got everything ready here. And uh, I, I just thought, isn't it incredible that we're now here? It was horrible putting up Christmas trees and decorations, but having no people in the room. And I know you're all watching from home, but it's so good that we're here together, uh, worshiping God and, uh, and that we can be together and lift up His name. And I wonder if we could worship like we haven't done yet in this building as we close today. In light of that incredible privilege that we have to know Jesus, to be invited into His presence, I wonder if we could lift up His name. Let's pretend it's a football match and just give it everything to Jesus. Because, come on, we've got to do this, to stand and sing. If you're at home today watching, and I know Some of you have been stuck at home for weeks for various reasons and it's grown old and and maybe you're even cooking now or doing other things and watching in the background. Can I invite you, come stand in front of your TV because we're gonna praise God. We're gonna give glory to Him. And we don't give glory to God like this, mumbling the words under our songs, uh, under our lips. We give glory to God by lifting up our hands, raising our voices. And I believe for some of you, you're gonna receive a breakthrough as you lift your voice like you never have done before because we know this we know praise precedes a breakthrough you know that last week you know I had a cold and wasn't well and I couldn't sing out very loudly and I was pushing through because I was saying no God my voice is sore but I'm going to praise you through how my voice is feeling I don't think that's very good medical advice but I was determined to give glory to God I didn't want to be held back by who I am by my own personality listen I never want to raise my hands I never want to sing out I'm an introvert I want to be hidden in a corner on my own with some quiet music but that's not, not what God demands of me what God asks of me he's the great the highest he saved my life and he deserves everything so as the band lead we're gonna raise our voices we're gonna jump up and down and listen this isn't hype because God is so great we can't hype up God we can't do it this isn't me trying to create a moment this is us recognizing and giving glory to the one who holds all the glory to the one who has saved our lives so come on let's raise our hands Jesus we thank you today you are so worthy we thank you for the invitation to know you we thank you that we were sinners and we were blind and we were lost but you gave us an invitation to encounter you Jesus and so to Today we give you everything. We give-